Welcome to the Bikers live show. My name is Teemu Arena. I'm the creator of Bikers Summit and co-author of the Bikers Handbook. Sorry about the little delay in getting this all started up. Today our guest is Dr. Molly Malouf. Um, I'm so excited to have her because she is on a mission to radically extend health span, maximize human potential and redefine healthcare using medicine, technology, education and media. And what I really like about her work is that she's been diving deep into quantified self and how we can measure what's going on in the human body. How can we make visible this black box and optimize the different aspect that, aspects that go into optimal health, performance and well-being. And she's been actually preparing for coming to Finland to speak at the Biker Summit by getting some extended sauna sessions and uh, you will you will notice when she comes on to the call that uh, she is pretty hardcore when it comes to going to sauna <laughs> and <laughs> optimizing blood sugar and uh, immune system function as well as life extension, autophagy and all those different topics that we're going to be discussing today. So uh, welcome Molly to the call. Sorry about that. All good. How's it going? <laughs> All good. Looks like looks like you just came out of a sauna. It's true. I've been sauning every day for like the last month to optimize detoxification. Oh, wonderful! You also came from Burning Man. Did you know that actually Finland uh, brought world's largest like sauna to Burning Man? And uh, oh, some, interesting. Yeah, some of my friends were running sessions over there. I had a list of all of the spas and the saunas at Burning Man, but I only made it to two out of 15. But I, I'm, I'm really upset I didn't know that, that you had friends there. Yeah, yeah. They, they built this huge, like, um, uh, round, uh, big sauna uh, for people at Burning Man. But if you missed that one and our audience missed Burning Man and all the different bathing options, you're welcome to Biker Summit in Helsinki, Finland, 1st and 2nd of November. And uh, as you know, um, the wood heated sauna um, originates from Finland, especially the smoke sauna version, where you heat the sauna with smoke. Um, and wow. uh, yeah, the stones are hot for like 24 hours, and it takes wow. yeah, it takes 12 hours to heat uh, properly a smoke sauna. And um, uh, one of the gentlemen from the Finnish Sauna Society, where the research into the health benefits of sauna originates from, um, is going to be there. An old gentleman, and his business card reads, traditional Finnish smoke sauna heater. He will be there guiding people into the health benefits of sauna. And what I learned from him is that actually the qualities of sauna that are most important for a good sauna experience are invincible. Those are the basic elements of nature. So fire that brings heat, water, which is basically the humidity, the steam, the water that you, you throw on the stones. Also mm. air, so you need good ventilation, so there should be direct access to uh, uh, fresh air, also in a mm. sauna experience. And also earth, which is basically the stone or uh, whatever material that is made out of. So, wow. yeah, the combination, the perfect balance of these basic elements linked to your uh, presence as a spirit in the sauna is, is what creates uh, the perfect sauna experience. And what is a good sauna experience is different for each individual. So going to sauna is not a competition who's going to be staying there longest, um, but it's a personal experience of... Uh, of connecting to your body and uh, to all these basic elements and, and to healing. And in a Finnish sauna, it's, it's definitely not, nothing to do with um, uh, gender, nothing to do with status. So basically undress all mm -hmm. uniforms and whatever labels you place on yourself. And you're just a human being with, with other humans there sharing an experience. So that's what Finnish sauna experience is all about. So I can't wait to do a lot of this. Yeah, yeah. So um, Dr. Rhonda Patrick came a couple of years ago to Finland um, uh, and also visited the Finnish Sauna Society. And, and she's a big fan of, um, of, of bathing as, 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 as a way of uh, extens extending lifespan. 
And mm-hmm. uh, she spoke a lot about activating things like the Foxo tree pathway for longevity and all that. So, um, uh, Molly, what what are your favorite aspects of sauna uh, when it comes to health benefits? Well, the first one I can think of is just the fact that it causes massive amounts of vasodilation in your periphery. So that means it's activating your parasympathetic nervous system. Um, when you're really stressed out, you tend to contract your blood vessels and that brings blood flow to the central organs. But when you go into a sauna, it causes vasodilation. So it activates the parasympathetic nervous system and it's deeply relaxing. Um, most people in, you know, biohacker culture are pretty hard driving, high performing individuals who often don't take enough time for rest and relaxation. So sauna kind of forces your body into it physiologically. Um, I also really love the aspect of detoxification. So sweating is one of the healthiest things you can do. And it's one of the best things for your skin. It's one of the best things for eliminating toxins like heavy metals and mercury. Um, so I had high mercury levels and I decided to start using sauna and glutathione to help eliminate that. And I was really impressed by how much progress I made within a month. I'm going to be retesting soon. Um, hopefully getting a few more weeks of sauna in before I test my mercury levels. But um, overall, I feel it just enhanced brain function, uh, mental clarity. And it's just a w- really nice way to start a day. I'll, um, I know you're not supposed to bring your phone into the sauna, but I found that my iPhone works pretty well within 30, 30 minutes of sauna use. <laughs> so I basically will like check my email and I'll, um, I'll do you know some work in the sauna. But um, I also recorded a podcast in a sauna recently in New Zealand at Aroha Retreats. So you can actually get a lot of cool, you know, you can, you can have meetings in saunas, you can uh, hang out with your friends. It's a great way to just have a social experience. So I invite people to go to this place called the Archimedes Banya in San Francisco, which is a Russian bathhouse. And it's a great way to socialize. So, I mean, I love sauna for all the different reasons that I just listed. Oh, yeah. You mentioned many good benefits for sauna. One of my favorite things is that if you go to a sauna at least once a week, you significantly reduce your risk for seasonal flu. Um, it increases oh, the n- yeah. number of yeah, it increases the number of white blood cells, and uh, yeah, it it really stimulates the immune system in, in, in a way that you can you can definitely avoid getting sick by doing that on a regular basis. And looking at all this, you know old gentlemen that go to Finnish sauna society with white birds and hair, uh, they look extremely healthy and their brains also function very well. And it seems to have a cognitive benefit. And um, personally, what I really like about it is is definitely the clarity, the mental clarity that it brings by doing it on a regular basis. I also heard that it increases your VO2 max if you do it consistently. Yeah, there is, so, there is some research yeah. that shows that it's uh, similar to doing... Uh, some moderate exercise. Right. Yeah. And so one of the things that I do for clients with chronic fatigue is I actually prescribe sauna Hmm. because I think it's really important. If you can't exercise, you can at least sit in a hot space and, you know, exercise is life. Movement is life. But if you can't move a lot because you're really sick, then sauna might be a second best option. Right. What other things do you prescribe to your patients that are not medication on a regular basis that you find is key and essential for optimal healthy living? Well, as you saw in the video, um, understanding blood sugar and, and understanding metabolism is just paramount to overall health and longevity. So I'm actually fasting right now, drinking a little bit of LaCroix, but um, fasting is free. It doesn't cost anything. It just requires you to understand a little bit about basic physiology and it trains your mental fortitude in ways that um, I think are really important in modern life. I think we've become a very fragile world. Um, A lot of people living in modern societies are not as resilient or able to handle significant stress. So the nice thing about um, fasting is it's a hormetic stressor on the body's physiology that enables you to drop into ketosis very quickly Um, Even after a 16-hour fast, you can test your body's ketone levels and you can notice that you'll be in mild ketosis. So um, I recommend people measure this with an Abbott Freestyle Libre using basically measuring continuous glucose, but also measuring ketones with an Abbott um, Precision Extra. And when you can understand your metabolic flexibility through your numbers, 
and see that you're dropping into ketosis and see that your blood sugar is dropping, but your ketones are rising, you'll know that you have enough fuel to survive. The problem is that a lot of people are metabolically inflexible. So when they try to fast, they don't raise their ketones fast enough. And so they bonk. And when you bonk, you feel absolutely like garbage. You basically feel like you've run out of fuel. And that's not where we want people to be. So I use measurements to actually identify where a person's at. I mean, if you're under a lot of stress, you're going to see your blood sugar actually rise during a fast. And so that may not be the, the, out, the, the, the perfect time for a person who's metabolically inflexible to begin fasting. So I, in that case, I'll tell a person to really focus on what they're eating instead of, um, instead of actually adding too much fasting. And then I'll slowly, gradually get them into fasting. But I think we, we're really lucky that we have tools now that can show us what's happening in our body as we change our behavior. Um, but yeah, I mean, like even just a 14 hour fast is good for health. And that's a really simple behavior that a person can, can do even without any monitoring. Right. Yeah. And, and people who are watching this live, uh, if you, if, if, we, if you turn and show my screen, Etu, um, so freestyle Libra is basically this device that you attach. Um, it, it's slightly invasive. So you attach it on your, on your arm and it gives you. Uh, I guess like a couple of weeks uh, of continuous blood glucose monitoring and you see all these graphs then and how food affects um, uh, and, and just about anything, including mm -hmm. sauna, how it affects your blood sugar levels. And um, so there is other devices also like uh, XCOM, I think is also producing a device like this. And I think the future for continuous blood glucose monitoring will not be for diabetics. It will be for just regular healthy people uh, as it becomes oh, yeah. easier easier and easier and smaller and smaller and uh, less invasive and more accurate. It becomes something that we can use on a daily basis to manage our energy levels. So what can you talk about that? Well, I've been using CGM in my practice for about five years now, and it's totally transformed my health. Um, the benefit I have is I can order them wholesale so I can wear them all the time. Um, but for most people, when you attach a blood sugar monitor and you just eat normally, you actually see a lot of information about how your diet's affecting your body. And I've learned that I just cannot eat white flour in any form without it causing a blood sugar spike. So I should be like, I really have to be careful about the kind of carbs that I consume. Um, I'm very sensitive to sugar and refined carbohydrates. Um, in terms of, I'm, I'm, in terms of my body will respond by raising my blood sugar significantly too high. Um, if you eat a higher fat diet as well, you are going to be naturally be a little bit more prone to blood sugar spikes if you eat refined carbohydrates. So it's really important to, to know what's going on in your body as you make metabolic changes, um, and to see how those changes are, are affecting, um, different biomarkers. So you know, if you're, if you, tr if you try different dietary styles, you can see how those styles affect your blood sugar and you can see if they're helping you adapt better to the, you know, nutrition that you're eating in the world that you're living in or, or you, are you not adapting to those things? So, um, you know, I really, I really recommend it combined with laboratory tests, um, because it's, it's, you're not seeing the full picture by just looking at blood sugar. You also want to know about lipid metabolism. Um, but it's really helpful for seeing how um, your body responds to exercise, how your body resp responds to stress. You can see more stress um, in a blood sugar curve by glycemic variability. So the curve just gets noisier. Um, and so people don't really understand the, the relationship between stress and blood sugar, but, it, but cortisol causes insulin resistance. Um, and it would have been a protective response in, in a primitive time because it would have enabled your body to take blood sugar and preserve it for the brain because your brain really preferentially likes sugar over ketones. And so, so insulin resistance during stressful times would have been a very adaptive response, but in modern life when we're under constant chronic stressors, it's very maladaptive. So now we have a lot of people with insulin resistance and don't even know, don't even know they have it. Hmm. So the, the reason why they don't know they have it is because they go to the doctor and they get a hemoglobin A1C or they get a fasting blood sugar and it might look normal, but then you put a blood sugar monitor on and you can actually see that a blood at a person's, a person's not responding normally to different dietary styles, um, or to the stress in their life. 
And if you don't look at the curve, you don't actually see the real world response to your lifestyle. Hmm. By the way, if uh, there is audience listening, if you go to Biker Summit YouTube channel, there is uh, the live stream for this one. And uh, there's a chat. If you have any questions to Dr. Molly Malouf, uh, you're welcome to ask your questions and I'll bring them on. Uh, so I'll be monitoring that um, channel for, for any questions that might arise. Now, when it comes to stress uh, uh, in terms of modern lifestyle, um, I guess um, many things, including cortisol, also um, the fact that we are not necessarily uh, living according to our chronobiology, all of those mm -hmm. have uh, detrimental effects on so many different variables in our bodies, uh, including um, blood sugar management um, and uh, uh, hormones and, and so on. So, so what are the consequences of um, kind of pushing the boundaries of, um, of this homeostatic uh, equilibrium that uh, we humans are, are true evolution designed to live in? Um, can, can, so, so basically circadian rhythm dysfunction is a really unfortunate side effect of modern life because of the way we've designed societies and cities and lighting in particular. So we've switched over most cities to, um, to, we've switched away from incandescent lights to LED lights. And, um, the problem with that is that the blue spectrum is really bright and, that blue spectrum suppresses melatonin production. So people who stare at screens late at night, who look at their phones way, way too often, um, they're, they're just getting too much blue light in their, in their eyes and that they're not actually sending the right signals to their brain to turn off um, alertness. And on top of that, a lot of people aren't getting outdoor sun first thing in the morning. And so they're not getting that beautiful sunlight that sends a signal to their super chiasmatic nucleus that it's time to be awake. And so people who live in dimly lit um, buildings or who, are, who go to offices with poor lighting um, are also throwing off their circadian rhythms. Now that, that's, that's just most people, but uh, there's a good subsection of the population that has shift work. And shift work is just absurdly detrimental to health. It is, it's, a, it's a known carcinogen now. It's known to increase the risk of cancer. And so if you live um, in a way that's not in alignment with the environment, you're going to develop disease because your genes are, designed, are adapted to a different era. And the problem with this is we haven't figured out how to change it. So, um, you know, we basically have to change our lifestyles to fix these problems. And so I see you're wearing these special glasses to avoid the blue light in your eyes right now. Yeah, these are blue light blocking glasses and it's evening here in, here in Helsinki, Finland and Molly is in Los Angeles and it's morning over there. Yeah. So yeah, um, there is also, you know, the, the modern lifestyle is also, uh, also full of, you know, opportunities to eat. Um, so the sun goes down and we have all this electronic lighting and we can, we can still, you know, go for restaurants and feed and watch television and uh, have late have late night snacks, and uh, that also seems to have an effect on our blood sugar management. So, so what are the consequences of eating after the sun goes down, and especially wow. at night when melatonin secretion starts? Well, if you think about it, um, it makes sense for your body to be the most insulin sensitive during the day because you would be using the fuel that you'd be consuming likely through an active lifestyle of hunting and gathering. Okay. So if you eat late at night, your body is not as insulin sensitive. So you are going to have a higher blood sugar. The same pasta meal eaten midday is not going to have the same blood sugar response in the evening. So <clears throat> although carbohydrates do contribute to better sleep, they certainly don't, excuse me, one second. they certainly don't contribute to better blood sugar. Um, <clears throat> so you'll hear a lot of different people talk about when's the best time to eat carbs. I personally think the best time to eat them is around movement and activity because carbs are fast burning fuel. They're designed to be digested and used. Um, and then if they're not being used, they're going to be stored as fat. 
So to me, it seems very unnatural to eat a large carbohydrate meal in the evening when you're not intending to use the food, unless you want to build a fat store, which would have been very adaptive in primitive times, because basically people used <clears throat> eating food to charge their, their cell, cellular batteries and then, to, and then to, to store extra fuel in the event that there wasn't food available. So the problem is, is that food is always available now. Mm. So I don't think in modern life, it makes sense for us to want to store a bunch of extra fat. But if you are trying to gain weight, then of course eat as often as you'd like. But if you want to maintain a lean body physique, then I recommend scheduling your carbs around your fitness activities, preferably during the day. Yeah. There is a lot of discussion around, um, you know, the fact that the brain runs on glucose. And um, I was recently reading uh, an, uh, an analysis of, of this from Virta Health, uh, the team behind that company. Mm -hmm. if, if we can have my screen up, and you can also show Molly what I'm looking at, Edu. And also, yeah, thank you. Yeah, just a second. Here we go. And let Molly also see what I what I see. Cool. So they did a two-year clinical trial on reversing type 2 diabetes with nutritional ketosis. And what I really like about uh, the res results uh, and also the remission values, if you take a look at the blood sugar effects of, um, of two years of... Um, nutritional ketosis, you notice uh, 12% reduction in body weight. Um, there is some combined marker called HOMA uh, uh, IR, IR, which is a combination of uh, uh, hemoglobin A1C, uh, fasting blood glucose, and um, uh, insulin. And uh, the, it's, it's calculated. Um, I think it's one of the more accurate uh, markers for insulin resistance. Now, there is a reduction of 32% compared to usual care with uh, usual diabetic medication. So in usual care, people increased HOMA-IR by 49%. Now, wow. now in terms of uh, triselcerides, they reduced by 22%, and HDLC um, increased. Um, right, but you know what they didn't list here is they didn't list LDL. So when you eat a high fat diet, you often see triglycerides drop, HDL go up, and then you'll see LDL also go up. Um, and the, the thing is, is that Verta Health is a fabulous company. I love what they do. But we have to understand that like a lot of this is um, <clears throat> related to the fact that they're also eating less. Um, most people in ketosis are not hungry as often, so they're not eating as much. And the best study that, that I would like to see that hasn't been done yet is I want to see the high carb plant-based people have one diet. I want to see the low fat, so low carb, high fat people have one diet. I want to see the same amount of calories consumed. And then I want to see all the biomarkers tracked. Hmm. So Verda is not reporting LDL particles. They're not reporting LDL. That is not, um, to me, that's like slightly misleading. We want to see the big picture. Now, I think that LDL is not as important as triglycerides or HDL, but I still think it's by the fact that they leave that out, it, it's a little bit like they're, it's like, well, okay, so what happened there? You know? Right. Um, and I'm, I'm, you know, there's a company in uh, San Diego that offers a high carb, low fat diet. Now, I would never prescribe this diet typically, but you do see this dietary style in a lot of the world, especially in the developed, the, the indigenous parts of the world and people have healthy blood sugar levels. Um, they tend to live around the equator and they tend to be, they tend to have a really highly active lifestyle. Um, Verda Health is based in San Francisco. It's in a place, it's in a part of the world that has less sun and generally is a more mild climate. So I think that it's also important to think about how a human adapts to different dietary styles depending on where they live and what's mm -hmm. available to them. Right. So it's very possible that a higher fat, lower carb diet is better for people who live at higher latitudes versus a higher carb, low fat diet, which might suit somebody living closer to the equator. 
Um, yeah, I also lot- I, I know this yeah. when I go closer to Equator, I kind of uh, after living there for a while, I I grab more uh, fruits and I, mm-hmm. I seem to work pretty well on that. And the sun goes down extremely quickly compared to here in Finland. Yeah. It might be lingering up there, and and here I I kind of naturally gear more towards high fat diet. So so right. so would there be a genetic component here, or yes. or is it also related to this day night cycle? There's definitely a genetic component for sure. Probably the day and night cycle um, contributes because of the sun exposure, but there's this concept of mitochondrial haplotypes and we're going to get real nerdy right now if we want to get into this, but basically these haplotypes determine how well you couple or uncouple. Um, And that means how well you, um, and I might be getting this wrong, but basically coupling tendency in mitochondria determines how well your body converts um, fuel into heat and ATP. And so somebody, I'd have to look this up because I, I always get the word wrong. Um, but I was talking to a friend about this yesterday and I have a bunch of notes on this, but I haven't unfortunately memorized it. Um, let's see here, mitochondrial health. Basically, um, certain people who live at the equator are able to produce more heat effectively and take, so when they eat the carbs, they generate, um, they, they're able to, no, no, I'm thinking about, it might, be, it might be opposite. So um, people living at the equator, I believe are able to use carbs as fuel effectively and generate, generate ATP more efficiently. And then people who live at higher latitudes, I think are able to generate more heat from the fuel that they consume, which keeps them warmer in those places. Could it be so, because of the brown adipose tissue, the BAT, yes, because of cold exactly. exposure? Uh, I mean, exactly. when you do, you know, this Wim, uh, this Wim Hof method and you, you, you go ice swimming and you expose yourself to cold baths, right. you're increasing right. the amount of BAT and that makes you better at fat burning also. That's into, right. Uh, That's right. Hmm. And, and also there's just less food available typically at higher latitudes. So you would naturally be fasting more and fasting naturally produces more brown adipose tissue. Whereas if you're lower latitudes, you're walking a lot, you're moving a lot, you need that quick burning fuel that you'd find in the savanna in the forests, because that would have been available to you to pick and to consume and to keep moving. Um, so this is what, this is part of like my, my theory on um, why these different nutritional styles um, are, are, you know, are helpful to test and to, to train yourself. Right. So there, there will be individual differences and in looking at which part of the world you live in, there might be also differences in terms of uh, what would be an optimal diet? Now, there's a question from Iris Voss on the fact that, yeah, her stepmother was just diagnosed with diabetes too. Would you have tips to naturally manage blood sugar to positively affect um, considering her diabetes? Now, we are we are not uh, obviously She's providing. Yeah. Um, can you? Repeat? Oh yeah, we're not providing medical advice for no, sure. No, not at all. This is just uh, like. Just you know, theoretically, if we if if I had like pre-diabetic um, markers going on, um, what would you do in terms of nutritional intervention? Like, um, for example, why don't I talk about my own health, um, which I think is something that I can speak on? Um, a few years ago, I put a glucose monitor on, and I thought I was in really good health. I was eating healthy food, I was eating healthy ingredients, but I had what I call pre-pre-diabetes, and that means I was right below pre-diabetes. My fasting blood sugar was in the upper nineties. And my postprandial blood sugar was right below 140, sometimes hitting slightly above 140. And so I was saying to myself, well, I'm not a diagnosis yet, but I definitely want to start moving the direction of my blood sugar in, in the ways of better health. And that's when I realized something. Um, when I started doing research on blood sugar, I started realizing that blood sugar is just a marker of our ability to adapt to the life that we're living. And is our lifestyle adaptive or maladaptive to health? And so blood sugar is kind of a mark. It's like a, it's like a really great marker for overall health. And so when I think about a person who's becoming more diabetic, more pre-diabetic, it's like their body's homeostatic set points are slowly fast, slowly moving in the direction of worse health. And it's, it's this body's way of saying, I'm trying to adapt. I'm trying to adapt. I'm getting stuck. I'm getting stuck. And I'm getting, and basically they're, they're, the set point keeps moving as their body is not adapting. And so you have to ask yourself, why is your lifestyle not contributing to an adaptive response? 
And maybe it's that you're eating too much fast food or, or high, high fat, high sugar foods. The, the top three sources of calories in the American diet are like pies and pastries and sodas and, and like breads. Okay. These are typically high carb, high fat foods. People put fat on bread all the time. Right. Yeah. And the breads that we're eating are, are GMO grains that are really not adaptive to the microbiome. So we eat these foods that damage the microbiome. We eat these foods that damage our blood vessels through blood sugar spikes and our blood and our body starts surging insulin to respond to these foods that are causing metabolic disarray. On top of that, we have really high stress lives and we don't realize where our stress is coming from because we don't wear heart rate variability monitors. So we don't see what's causing the blood sugars, the blood, um, the, the blood pressure and heart rate spikes, which are happening when you're responding to stressful situations. So, you know, I like the Garmin Vivo Smart 4 because it shows you your heart rate. It shows you your heart rate variability. Yeah. It's really inexpensive. It uses first beat technology. Yeah, I also um, have to have a, for a device like that. So this is a Gar- this is a Garmin Vivo Move HR, and it has the first beat technology. First beat is, by the way, from Finland, and first beat, to my knowledge, is probably coming to Biker Summit <laughs> also. Exactly. Yeah, and and Garmin has oh, has built in algorithms. Yes, exactly. People need to know this because this is a, this is a really powerful tool you can wear. And like I would wear the Vivo Smart, and I was under a lot of stress, and it would actually remind me to breathe. It would te- it would know that my heart rate was high, and it would it would actually send me a signal you need to relax. Um, the other thing is movement, right? Like the, the three top causes of damage to mitochondria, according to um, this one this one expert in. Uh, Columbia University, Martin Picard, who I really look up to, is overeating, inactivity, and too much stress. So the way that I think about this is overeating any food, even healthy food, is like pouring too much gas into your gas tank. It's not good for the engine. It's not good to over overfill your tank. You want to drain your tank regularly. You want to drain the glycogen stores, which is your carb stores, and you want to tap into your fat stores. Fasting is the way to do that. So I tell people to start with nutrition, up the, the really pigmented fruits and vegetables, reduce the packaged processed foods, and increase the um, healthy lean proteins. And that will naturally lower your blood sugar, but then you'll want to start fasting when you're metabolically more flexible. And that's, that means starting with 14 hours of fasting for a few months, and then upping it to 16 hours, and then adding a 24-hour fast, maybe a 36-hour fast if you're you know, a rock star like, like me. Um, I do a 36 hour, I do a 72, 72 hour fast every quarter. And I'm actually starting to organize fasting retreats with friends of mine mm. to get people trained in how to fast. Um, the last time I did a three day fast, I had the most unbelievable surge of energy after I added back when I started eating again. And it was one of the most amazing rejuvenating experiences that I, I like to do every quarter. Um, but then fitness moving after meals is a great way to dispose of the blood sugar. So just walking 15 minutes after a meal, doing a wall sit if you're at work for two minutes, this can drain, this can basically take your muscles, put them into an active state where they don't need a lot of insulin and they can take in the blood sugar. So the, I mean, these three things alone, um, as well as adding the supplement berberine and maybe vanadium and chromium, which are often deficient in people with blood sugar abnormalities. Um, chromium is a really valuable use, valuable supplement. Berberine is a really valuable supplement. Um, chromium around 400 micrograms a day is what I typically like to take myself. And I also like to take berberine 500 milligrams, um, with meals. Um, I take it once a day, but some people, you know, take it more often if they, they have worse blood sugar, these things alone, you should see a a dramatic improvement. And I've actually dropped my fasting blood sugar from upper nineties to lower eighties in doing in, in like a, in like a few years. And then I've also gotten my postprandial blood sugar down from upper one forties to you know, one ten or below is where I like to see my body, and that's all lifestyle. Right on. Uh, I also would recommend uh, some medicinal mushrooms uh, because of the beta yeah. glucans. Uh, yeah. The beta glucans are are great for blood sugar management. Also, maybe some vinegar um, before oh, vinegar, meal. Sure. Vinegar is definitely good for uh, a gluconeogenesis. And uh, uh, in terms of medicinal mushrooms, there is this m- mushroom called Agaricus blase. And Ooh. agaricus blase uh, is is one of the most effective ones to completely stabilize your blood sugar. Um, you, 
how do you spell that? Agaricus. Uh, uh, I'm so so horrible in terms of, um, but there is a four sigmatic uh, ten mushroom blend I yeah. think uh, that has this uh, uh, agaricus blase and a bunch oh, of yeah, others. Yeah. Others. Uh, so look at the ingredient list; you'll find oh, it. Yeah, there's even research on PubMed on this. Yeah, it's it's pretty amazing. A friend of mine who is a diabetic uh, told me about it. That she tried everything, and uh, this was the most effective tool for completely demolishing blood sugar spikes. That's amazing. I love learning new things from people. Yeah. Uh, I want to bring on uh, Seam Lund in a, in a second, but uh, I'm going to play his video on how our ancestors uh, dealt with fasting and intermittent fasting and how that links to modern lifestyle. Imagine being a hunter-gatherer in the wild. The sun is blazing down on you. You haven't eaten for three days. Exhaustion is beginning to take you over and all hope starts to fade away. Now, that doesn't sound like a really good situation that you would want to be in. Please, no! However, that's something that early humans used to face on a daily basis. How on earth did our ancestors survive these harsh conditions? They didn't have much food, they were constantly on the move, and everything was uncertain in their environment. From the perspective of nutrition and diet, humans were very good at burning their own body fat and using it as a long-term storage for energy. Because think about it, if you hadn't eaten anything for two days, then it's paramount that you have enough muscle power and endurance to catch something. And that's where you would use the backup storage that you have. You would basically have to be a fat burning machine. Fat. Being a fat burner is great for not only losing weight, but also maintaining general metabolic health. A lot of the diseases of modern civilization are caused by excess nutrition coming primarily from fat as well as carbohydrates. On the flip side, if you were to practice some aspects of eating like a hunter-gatherer, which involves some periods of fasting, some periods of carbohydrate restriction, and some periods of feasting, and of course exercise, then you would definitely enable yourself to avoid those issues, at least most of them. Therefore, you should strive to be a fat burner not only for the aesthetic principles, but just for general health. Fact is it. <laughs> Wonderful. So, um, uh, what do you think in terms of modern diet, intermittent fasting, our ancestors, uh, and uh, uh, in terms of um, uh, looki looking at our lifestyle, uh, we are not really going out hunting food. We have constant access to supermarkets, like we have... Uh, home food delivery. Uh, yeah. There's all these dietary recommendations that you should eat, you know, regular meals and have snacks and all that. What do you think about all that recommendation and all that kind of uh, abundance of uh, fuel source that is kind of uh, distancing us from our ancestors? You want me to answer that? Because I have a really good answer. And that's that it's causing mass amounts of reactive oxygen species in the mitochondria basically like sparks are flying in your cells and those sparks are damaging cells and, and actually activating apoptosis. And, um, we, we have an over fueled society and it's causing chronic disease, plain and simple. So the remedy to this is not more drugs. It's not more surgery. The remedy is not eating. Turns out <laughs> <laughs> it's not eating as much, just activating autophagy and metophagy. Um, I'm really obsessed with my mitophagy in particular because basically it's throwing out the bad batteries that no longer carry, carry charge well, and it makes room for new batteries to grow through mitochondrial biogenesis practices like sauna or like exercise or, um, or different, you know, different other behavioral habits. So I think fasting fitness and certain supplements, um, as well as certain foods are really important for generating this natural cycle of mitochondrial biogenesis and mitophagy and and, the, and part of that cycle is not eating and if we're always eating we're never fully having healthy metabolisms and so we basically have chronic lifestyle diseases emerge from maladaptive metabolism so yeah i actually changed my batteries uh <laughs> get some more fu another alternative fuel source in now uh it kind of seems like we have to kind of artificially create, uh, you know, uh, conditions of uh, food shortage. And, uh, you know, uh, we also have to, 
uh, in some situations uh, simulate seasonality because nowadays we have access to fruits all winter and we have access to you know yeah. buffaloes all year long so uh, what do you think about this like in terms of food seasonality and also s- kind of uh, simulating uh, f- food shortages what do you think Sim? Mm, well definitely like uh, like like molly also mentioned that with the fasting and mitophagy aspect are something that modern nutrition or the or the habits of modern nutrition doesn't really include and that definitely leaves the person in a situation where they're over accumulating all these uh dysfunctional mitochondria and the problem with that is that if you're not removing them, then those diseased particles will start spread and they're going to damage the healthier ones as well. So it's like a vicious cycle or a chain reaction, which can only be uh, cleared out you know, effectively with mitophagy and uh, going into these longer periods of fasting because you're not really activating autophagy on a regular way of eating, even if you're really eating like a low fat, low fat diet or a low carb diet, you still need some aspects of complete. Uh, zero calorie intake where uh, you do activate autophagy because autophagy is very responsive to like calories in general. So even if you are eating very little food, uh, you're not really activating it to the fullest potential. So therefore, it's very, really uh, like a good idea to have some periods where, uh, you know, even like the daily time restricted eating, where you're confining your food window within a certain time frame, that's, that's all already like a good start. But then again, like when it comes to food combining, then I think uh, that's where the seasonal aspect comes into play, so to say. So because, you know, like you already mentioned in the earlier conversation as well, there are different, let's say, ancestral uh, hunter-gatherer groups living in different parts of the world, and they're eating like different diets. Some are, some are eating high-fat diets, some are eating uh, high-carb diets, and uh, but they're never eating like them together. They're never eating high fat plus high carb. <laughs> so yeah. that, that's that's where most of the problems come. That's where like insulin resistance uh, stems from as well. So you're uh, raising insulin with the carbs, but at the same time you're damaging your beta cells with the with fat, and uh, you're keeping your blood sugar elevated for longer, etc. And uh, th- that's where most of the kind of problems coming from. So uh, I think the seasonal aspect just means that. If, if you were to be in nature, then you would always eat either a high-carb, low-fat diet or you would eat a low-fat uh, or a low-carb, high-fat diet, so to say. So it's, you know, mimics some aspects of the seasonality, but you would rarely see them together. You would only maybe see them together in like the late fall or autumn where you're actually supposed to get fat and uh, supposed to accumulate uh, body fat storage for the coming winter. But yeah, like in the modern world, we can kind of really sidestep that and that's where a lot of like problems are coming from right uh cool. there's a there's a question from from the chat uh inka Imone is uh asking if there is um what specific can you say about the different types of fruits and their effects on blood sugar and fat burning fat storage so is there like some prefer preferred fruits that you would go for what do you think uh, molly um i personally mostly eat berries Although we've had a, an amazing <clears throat> season of figs recently and stone fruits. And so I will do a little bit of figs and stone fruits during um, the season while they're available, but not a lot because I find that the sugar does, um, does like, I, I feel the sugar high when I eat really high sugar food fruits. But I do think that if you're going to, if you're going to have fruit, um, seasonal is always best, but you really can't get, can't go wrong with berries. They tend to be the one that I eat year round, even though. They're probably not available year round where I live, um, but they see, but you know, I just, I really like the highly pigmented fruits that um, have a lot of phytonutrients. Um, I don't do a lot of mango or banana um, unless I'm traveling to like Singapore and I'll have like, a, it'll be like a, like a treat here and there. My favorite fruit is durian, but I don't live in a place that has durian. So I don't eat durian regularly. But if I lived in Singapore, I'd probably eat durian for breakfast like every day. Yeah. It's amazing. Durian is like, it, it smells like garlic. It reminds. It doesn't smell like garlic to me. Yeah, it's like a combination of putting mango, like if mango yeah. and avocado and garlic made love, it I would be a durian. I don't think it's garlicky. I don't get an Allison <laughs> smell from it. I, I think it's. I think honestly, it's like it's a pungent smell for sure. But it's almost like a, 
I don't know. Like it's the the texture is just magical. Yeah, it it smells like old socks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, think it's, I don't think it smells like that. I really don't. I, it's I a think really it's, pungent fruit. fruit what, what, um, what I like about durian is that when, once you start eating, you can't really stop. It gets better with every bite, for sure. It's, it's, it's just amazing. so good. I mean, I could eat a whole. I can literally eat a whole durian myself. What, one of my big favorite fruits in terms yeah. of putting into salads is pomegranate. Oh, I mm. love pomegranate. Yeah, mm. I love pomegranate just because. Um, it's super high in phytonutrients. I think it's a pigment, like a richly pigmented, colorful food is ideal. Um, I, I really like prunes as well. Um, just because, you know, they're, they're, they've got a lot of sorbitol. They're a great la- natural laxative, but they also just taste good. I think they taste really tasty. Mm. I'll eat like a couple of those here and there. Um, I'll use them in like a chia pudding as a sweetener, um, which I think is really, really tasty. Um, but yeah, I, I really go for the, the darkest, most pigmented stuff. I don't eat a ton of the high sugar fruits, um, unless it's a special occasion and I feel like it, but yeah, I mean like one of the, well, the thing I did right, right when I got back to, from Burning Man, I made, um, and this is like me, this is my version of junk food, by the way. Like I made a, a natural ice cream out of coconut and, um, fig, basically just coconut fig and a little bit of sea salt. And, um, you put it in a blender and. It is a high sugar, high fat treat, but if I'm going to eat that versus like dairy ice cream, I think it's a better option. Yeah, you know, I think people should upgrade their candies. We have uh, Oli Posti is a, is a Finnish guy who wrote a, bo- a book called uh, Supermarket Survival, and he yeah. he speaks there about upgrading like candies to alternatives that you can find from a, a store. For example, maybe frozen Actually, frozen. Yeah, maybe frozen blueberries uh, could be one mm-hmm. option. Yeah. Um, he also recommends things like dates that you can dip into something like uh, licorice. Yeah. Uh, honey is a, is a, is a, is a great um, way you can dip all kinds of things into honey. I would be careful with honey though, just because it is a really high sugar yeah, item. Fructose. I I make um, a date caramel with raw almond butter, and from like a really great supplier, this grocery store in Mill Valley. And I also add um, maca and mesquite and salt. And then I make like a uh, mushroom-based cacao. And then I'll make a seeded base out of like sesame seeds, chia seeds, flax seeds. And, and honestly, like it's, it's, a, it's like a candy bar, but it's all natural ingredients. And I'm telling you, every single person I've made this for, they're like, this is incredible. And it doesn't touch your blood sugar. Like right. you won't even, you would not see a spike in your blood sugar. So, um, so- so, so, uh, Seem, what is your favorite? Uh, and after that, I'm actually going to show everyone something interesting from my screen. So, what, what is Seem your favorite fruit? Um, I would say maybe like I also like primarily eat some uh, berries, like blueberries and uh, bilberries. Uh, but uh, if I were to go for like a higher carb fruit, then maybe uh, either like pineapple. Pineapple is really good. I, I like it for the digestive enzymes. Mm-hmm. Uh, but usually, even like a grapefruit is a really good one that I sometimes enjoy. Love grapefruit. <laughs> Super. Yeah, the, the the problem with fruit is that it's not actually the best kind of carb to eat in excess. So it's always like a moderate thing. Yeah. Because it's re- very easily converted into like uh, triglycerides and uh, sure. and fat, fat storage. So Although, always. Yeah. yeah. I have read though, I mean, I, I really tried to dig into fruit and diabetes last year when I was studying blood sugar. I mean, I did research for a CGM company and I couldn't find any evidence that suggests that fruit contributes to diabetes. Now, um, that might, I mean, I mean, I could be wrong and I maybe just be missing some studies, but because of that, I'm a little bit less um, afraid of it as I used to be, but I do still recommend that people use it around fitness activities. Mm. Like, like one of the best fitness, um, fruits is watermelon because it has, it's high in um, citrulline naturally. So I've had some bodybuilders and, and like CrossFitters tell me that they use it in, re, in as a replacement for creatine. Um, wow. So they just use these watermelon and it's pretty, pretty low calorie as well. How many, how many, how, ma- how much watermelon do you have to drink or eat to get like a significant I, amount of creatine? I don't, know. <laughs> I, I don't I, I'm not actually, I'm not exactly sure. It's, I think it's more, for, more about the citrulline and, um, right. and a, a few other, you know, um, antioxidants that they are looking for. That's, that's great advice. Uh, another 
not really fruit, but a root vegetable that I like to enjoy before workouts is beetroot because of the nitric oxide and yeah. the vasodilation effects. Uh, let's take over my screen and I'm going to show, uh, if, you, if you can also show them what I'm seeing. So uh, on Instagram, there's a great account, jesse.inkauspe. I, I, I don't know if I completely butchered that name, but take a look at that. Uh, it's a great profile. Uh, she's been using a continuous blood sugar monitor uh, to see the different effects uh, the different combinations of breakfast might be having on your blood sugar. So here you see, for example, if you have some kind of high carb kind of uh, protein bar versus uh, a keto bar, how that affects your blood sugar. Uh, here's another example on uh, uh, having uh, like some, some kind of uh, jamba juice in an empty stomach, so some kind of high-carb kind of drink um, uh, versus uh, having it right after lunch. So you might want to also consider timing when it comes to high-carb um, oh, yeah. intake. Here is another example, whole wheat toast versus whole wheat toast with unsweetened peanut butter. Can you see that? So there is less of a spike with peanut butter. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so another reason to have peanut butter, I guess, for some people. Uh, here is another example on alcohol. So having a bottle of beer versus two glasses of champagne. As you can see, champagne, no spike in terms of blood sugar. I guess if you drink more, that, that will change. Um, so, so yeah, and, and sometimes like, um, let's, let's see, I think there was some, some really great examples. Yeah, here is chocolate. So 70% chocolate versus 75% chocolate or more. You can see less of a blood sugar spike. So another reason to go for um, chocolate that is, uh, is high, high in terms of, um, of chocolate content. And here is uh, fat-free milk versus whole milk. Not much difference here. And uh, you mentioned stress. So stressful meeting. Uh, more of a crash in terms of blood sugar after the meeting versus uh, another stressful meeting with the boss. <laughs> so, so yeah, um, there is, uh, uh, oh yeah, here is like one of the worst things you can probably have for breakfast is cereal. <laughs> so special yeah. K, not a good thing, definitely, not at all. I think this is, this is all great stuff. Remember, so this is in our body. Yeah, I, I love this one. Apple, kale, cucumber, lemon, ginger, celery juice, one of my favorites, versus just having uh, like a coconut water. Both will re result in a blood sugar crash right after. So the, the sugar will definitely absorb pretty quickly with this. Uh, so there are great examples. Um, and and this, this, this one, I think, is very practical for anyone who's having breakfast. Have your protein first. So... Having eggs and beef jerky first, and then you know having your special K versus having the special K alone. Um, people have probably noticed that when you go to a restaurant, the first thing that they bring you is bread. We are conditioned to have you know carbohydrates quickly, so we associate um, feeling hungry to having a piece of bread. So they're just you know programming us to gray for bread now. If we actually brought something like in the Mediterranean, they have tapas. So you have like, let's say, some, some sausage or something like this to start your meal uh, before you have your carbohydrates. That might be a better idea. It's kind of priming your body that, hey, there is some food coming in with that protein. And uh, so your, your body, your blood sugar control would be better equipped and probably also your digestion in terms of slowing down the absorption of all those carbohydrates. So... Um, Having your protein first might be a good idea before having that, I guess, ice cream or something like that. So what's your take on some of these examples? I think it's really important for people to see, you know, how one person's body is responding to different foods because you might try the exact same experiments and have a totally different response because mm -hmm. your body's unique, your microbiome is unique, your lifestyle is unique. I mean, I really loved, I love the set, the, the one that she's got on um, the same chocolate caramel at 6 p.m. versus 9 a.m., like a completely different response. I mean, it's just, it's, a, it's just a great example of how your body's more insulin sensitive in the morning versus at night. Um, I actually want to meet this girl. I think she works at 23andMe. I'm going to have to meet her. Yeah, she works for 23andMe. And uh, 
uh, uh, here is the chocolate caramel example. So if you have chocolate caramel at 6 p.m., much more of a, of a spike versus having it as a breakfast thing uh, right after waking up. So yeah, there's a chronobiology, uh, uh, chrononutrition kind of element here that you can see. All right. I think it's also I think it's also important to kind of have this broader perspective in terms of like what's the uh, overall uh, you know fluctuations in the blood sugar throughout the entire day because it may be somewhat misleading in aspects of okay you see this slightly higher spike in that particular meal for example but if the rest of the day is you know r relatively flatlined then it's not that big of an issue in a sense because in my in my opinion like a slightly higher blood sugar response to a meal that's not necessarily a bad thing as long as the spikes themselves are less frequent so if you're constantly spiking the insulin then that can be a problematic but if you're like only spiking it let's say for instance once a day and uh, that's it then i would imagine that the healthy metabolism would you know just uh, recover from it quicker in a sense so so all, it's, it goes back to again like the higher eating frequency plus the high carb plus high fat foods that keep the blood sugar just elevated for too long and keep the keep the person in this state of uh, hyperinsulinemia mm. so uh, let's let's see if there is any questions on the chat um uh yeah. Do you believe in a DNA-based diet? Uh, so basically, I guess, like doing some kind of genetic testing and then going for nutrigenomic recommendations. Do you think, Molly, that is uh, prime time already in terms of uh, uh, things, or is it just a gimmick and the research is still out there? You know, I used to think that it was really, really important and valuable, but I now know that there's, it's like, in terms of nutrigenomics, like it's mostly valuable for supplements and vitamins and vitamin metabolism than it is for things like saturated fat per se. Although like I am an APOE4 um, carrier. So I do seem to raise LDL when I eat higher saturated fat diet. Um, so it can be useful. There are certain things that you can, you can, you can, I, and I do test it on every client because I think it is useful, but it's not enough. So it's, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient to, to, de to define a dietary style. You actually need to do other testing on top of that, like um, blood labs and nutritional evaluation, like or urine organic acids for nutrition evaluation. Um, if you don't do other tests, you don't actually know how your genes are expressed. So it's, it's like looking at the, looking at the like, architectural plans is one thing, but then you have to actually look at the house and how the house is functioning with, as it's been built to know what kind of, you know, resources it needs. So it's just kind of, um, it's just, a, it's just not enough. It's useful, but not enough. Hmm. Cool. So uh, I know Molly that, you know, you need to go to the sauna again soon and probably have a cleaning, <laughs> cleaning person coming over as well. So, so kind of ready to di dive deeper into wrapping up this thing. So I would love to hear your personal kind of, uh, things that you learned, uh, uh, through, you know, diving deep into all of this, what are your daily practices? Like, what are the things that you use to optimize your day from a blood sugar management perspective? Um, you know, the first thing I did when I got to LA was go to the grocery store to get things that I wanted to eat that I knew I would, that would be nourishing to me. Cooking is like a day. It's a pretty calm. I mean, almost every day I cook. Um, I think most people don't cook enough and don't have enough um, experience or skills. And so they're, you know, offloading their, you know, this very important skill and habit to, um, you know, companies that where you don't really know where the meat's coming from. When you get a meal delivered, you don't really know how much sugar or fat's in the meal. And it's just hard for you to really be, um, in optimal health if you're being fed by someone else. So cooking is really important. Fitness is really important. So I do some form of fitness almost every day. Um, I'll probably go to the beach today and do a run, do some sprints. Um, probably do, I mean, I'd like to do some high intensity interval training to boost my mitochondria. I'll probably, you know, what I like to do is if I'm traveling and I don't have access to a gym, I like to go to different fitness centers. Um, but I like to do weightlifting, yoga and hit training. And then I'm interested in getting into cycling just because I, I like the way it feels to cycle and I like cardio. Um, fitness is everything. Um, Meditation and mindfulness in some form or shape is important. Um, even if it means just taking 10 to 15 minutes to lay still quietly and try to 
not let your mind be filled with too many thoughts. I'm doing a meditation retreat uh, for two weeks in on starting on the 16th. So that's going to jumpstart my meditation practice practice for this year and really solidify a more, much deeper practice. Um, gratitude practices are really important. I don't think enough people think about how you can change your mind by your thoughts. So I, I have a lot of like brain f- switch flipping practices around how I think about things more positively, how I think about things more, um, how can I think about the world in a more loving and compassionate manner? Um, I really think that your, your mindset is everything. And then, you know, I like to connect with someone that I care about at least once a day. So whether it be a family member or a friend, um, I think that community and family are really important for health and often very overlooked. Um, so those are the big ones. I mean, making sure you're hydrated. I take all my supplements every day. I, t- I carry my supplements in a case where they're like, it's like a bead case and it's like a graph and I, p- I pull out the numbers that I'm taking. Um, those are pretty important for optimal health in my case. Um, and sunlight, getting some sunlight. Those are, those are the big ones. Oh, that's an amazing list. Do you seem have anything to add that uh, Molly didn't mention? Um, well, uh, I myself think that like uh, some fast, some fasting and time sheet eating is uh, really effective and probably oh, yeah, the, sure. the, the best best way of just plummeting <laughs> your blood sugar and uh, treating a lot of the uh, yeah. you know blood sugar related issues. So yeah, some skipping a few meals is uh, generally a good idea and uh, eating less often. <laughs> Oh, yeah. yeah, I just started um, fasting, doing intermittent fasting again after a, a couple of weeks of breaking off from that. So it's great. Mm. I like to drink uh, tea, uh, like have a pot and, you know, slowly sip through that. And it seems to um, reduce hunger and uh, it, it really gives me kind of a long lasting source of energy when I'm fasting. And uh, the same I've also noticed with ginseng. Ginseng seems to, some of the cognitive benefits seem to be linked to blood sugar regulation. I think it's uh, way too underrated as a, as a kind of nootropic uh, also. People talk about a lot of, lot of other things, but ginseng definitely is, is, is one of my favorite ones to, to go for. Now, cool. yeah, um, yeah, Molly is at Barker Summit. Uh, she's been, she, she will be sharing more tips and tricks for blood sugar regulation and management at the Bakker Summit. It's our five-year anniversary uh, in Helsinki, Finland, 1st and 2nd of November. And uh, yeah, there's everything when it comes to optimizing your day 24-7, how you can track uh, different aspects of your day, including blood sugar, how you can look at your diet and exercise and yeah, meditation practice, uh, uh, all the different things that go into working and having all that energy and joy and playfulness in your in your day to day life uh, to become a better version of yourself. So that's that's what we are diving into, and uh, we have actually an offer. So if you haven't yet booked your ticket, you can actually get it at the early bird price uh, by using the code Molly. Uh, you get fifty euros off uh, of a regular ticket. So go to buyhack two. To slash uh, 2019. So buyhack.to slash uh, 2019, and you'll be able to see who's coming over and and book the tickets. And if you're not able to come in person, we also have a live stream available that you can sign up for. So there's a live stream ticket, and uh, you can you know watch 40 keynotes uh, as 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 those unfold and get the recordings as well. Now with that, I I really thank you, Molly, for coming on the show, and I also appreciate greatly your authenticity of uh, actually coming straight from sauna. And that's what we're going to see a lot at the Biker Summit. Definitely people coming out of sauna or a cryo chamber or an infrared sauna uh, doing, you know, some bunch of crazy biohacks and uh, being themselves. And and that's amazing. You know, the world needs people like you uh, to show the way. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for showing me all these new cool ingredients I, I hadn't learned about yet. So thank yeah. you for that. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to your visit to Finland. And uh, with that, uh, you know, enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, I'm going to enjoy the rest of my evening. And thank you, Seem, once again for coming online. And to our audience over there, uh, have an extremely healthy uh, weekend. And if you uh, are looking for some biohacking that you may want to do, consider going for a sauna. That might be 
one of the great things for your health. Do that once a week and you will see the benefits unfolding as you age. So thank you very much, everyone. And uh, we'll be actually joining on Saturday with uh, Jaakko Halmet Oja, uh, the co-author of Biker's Handbook. And the discussion topic will probably be about nature connection and uh, the health benefits of all of that and his own practice when it comes to spending as much time in the wilderness as possible. So with that, see you next time.